invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the New Testament to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, this morning we'll consider verses 1 through 8. This is the word of our God. Let us give our attention to its reading. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue our study here of the Gospel John together, coming now to a new chapter, although really it's a continuing thought in the, gospel, in the gospel writer's mind. Not only do we know that because the chapters are later introduced, but also there is a connection here in our text, one that is very clear and very, uh, very clearly grammatical. For we read of a man who comes to Jesus by night, and we have just read at the end of John chapter 2 that Jesus knew what was in man. It sets us up, I think, very well for uh, the way that we might read or hear these words and hear Jesus answering Nicodemus when it doesn't seem that Nicodemus has asked him a question. It's because Jesus knew what was in man. I'm getting ahead of myself. We've continued our study together, working our way through the opening chapter of John's Gospel, looking first, of course, at how he lays out who Jesus is from the very beginning of the Gospel. He has no desire to hold off on who it is that Jesus uh, uh, truly is. That is, that he is very God of very God. He began in the very first verse to remind us that Jesus was God, that the Word was, was God, and that in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only is it the case that we know who it is that Jesus, uh, who it is that John says Jesus is, but also the purpose for which Jesus came. He came, of course, to redeem his people. He came that they might have that new birth, that birth from above or from God that we'll be considering this morning more more carefully. And so here we see in in the opening two chapters of John's Gospel how it is that the author lays out for us really everything that's going to follow by way of encouragement to show us that, that, that we, we, we are understanding the path that he is laying out for us. And so this morning our, our chapter focuses our attention on what it means to be born again. What it means to be born again. This is an important uh, 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 um, thing to consider. It's an important doctrine to consider It's one that is often misunderstood, as I'll try to show. We tend to think of being born again as something that we do. But Jesus makes very clear that it's not something that we do. It is, first and foremost, a work of God's Spirit. Let's consider our text this morning uh, as we work our way through these uh, these verses. It begins with this nighttime visit. Uh, the, the way in which the text is laid out, as I said, uh, that, that we get this introduction of a man who comes to Jesus after being told that Jesus knows what is in man. He knew everything about man. He needed no one to testify to him about man, whether that is of his wickedness or his sin or of his misery. It is all for those reasons that Jesus has come. And so we began our text then with these words. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a man of the Pharisees. Now, we've already been introduced to the Pharisees in the first chapter. They were the ones who had sent people to ask John the Baptist who he was and why he was baptizing. 
Indeed, the Pharisees are mentioned some 20 times in the Gospel of John, and they nearly always are portrayed as antagonistic to Jesus. I say nearly always because Nicodemus seems to be somewhat different. The roots of the Pharisees, remember, go back to the time between the Old and the New Testament. It's why when you read your Old Testament, you won't hear anything about Pharisees. But by the time you go to the New Testament, they are everywhere to be found, it seems. It's because they arise during that intertestamental period, those 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. Their name likely related to a, a word that means the separated ones. And they were very sincere and committed to keeping God's laws as they were defined and explained in their own oral tradition. It was, of course, their commitment to the oral tradition as it had come to be that had them conflicting often with Jesus. Just by way of example, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And so the Pharisees then are, are at least in some sense opposed to Jesus, wanting to know who he is, why he is doing the things that he's doing, by what authority he's going to do these things. We're going to see them interact with Jesus in many different instances. And we are told that Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. A couple of things to note about Nicodemus. First, of course, he's a Pharisee, which means that he's a very learned man. The Apostle Paul himself had tra been trained as a Pharisee, and they went through years and years and years of, of rigorous uh, training and examination. But he wasn't merely a Pharisee. No, his name, Nicodemus, a Greek name, it's one of two options here. Either it's being given as a way to protect his real identity, or it is, the, as is the case, the wealthier families would give their children two names one Hebrew, one Jewish, or one Jewish and one Greek, just as the Apostle Paul, whose name was Saul, he also had those two names. And so it's likely the case that Nicodemus comes from a family of prominence. And there's an indication of this reality. He's a ruler of the Jews. Now again, this is a word that's very particular, and John is using it in a very careful way here. It describes him not merely as a community leader, we can say, not merely as, as an elder within a community, but rather it marks him as one of the 70. If you know your biblical history, you know the 70. They are the Sanhedrin, the equivalent of the Jewish Supreme Court in the New Testament. They are the ones who would, who, who would condemn Jesus. They are the ones who, who, would, who would work hard against him in order to betray, have him betrayed and turned over. And so this is no mere Pharisee, we can say, although a mere Pharisee coming to Jesus would be noteworthy. But this is a man of prominence. This is a man of position. This is a man of power. And so he comes to Jesus, and he comes at night. He comes at night. And there's a couple of, uh, of reasons why, as I was working through the literature, as to why people say that he comes at night. The first is that the rabbis actually had said that nighttime was the best time to study the law because there were no interruptions. Others think that his timing was an act of prudence, an act of discretion. Jesus was busy during the day and he didn't want to bother Jesus. He seems to have some regard for him. Perhaps it was a matter of zeal on his part. As one commentator put it, Nicodemus was a man of business and could not spare time all day to, make Christ, make, to, to visit with Christ. Therefore, he would rather take time from the diversions of the evening, the rest of the night, and, 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 and converse with Christ. Or maybe, and you've probably heard it presented this way, it was more of an act of fear. He was afraid. He was ashamed to be seen with Christ. And so he came at night. Well, whatever the case, whatever the reasoning for his coming at night, that's how it's presented to us. Uh, another commentator, I think, made a good point that Jesus has said in the opening gospel, opening verses of John's gospel, that the light shines in the darkness. And here we have the darkness at nighttime, and Jesus' words will shine here and shine all the more clearly against Nicodemus' lack of understanding. What do we make of Nicodemus just from the outset? He is somebody who seems to slip in here in John chapter 3 and then go away. Do we hear from him again? Is there any reason to think that this is anything more than a, a, a wild curiosity or, or maybe even an attempt to trap or ensnare Jesus? The answer is yes. 
You see, in John's Gospel, we'll meet Nicodemus two more times. The next time will be in John chapter 7, verses 44 to 51, where Nicodemus will stand up in order to defend Jesus. He will defend Jesus against all the others because they want to work against him. And at that time, Nicodemus himself will be, will, will, will be rejected and he will be despised by the other Pharisees. But we'll see him one more time. For Nicodemus comes with Joseph of Arimathea to take Jesus' body off the cross and to lay it in the grave, to lay it in the tomb. As I reflected upon the life of Nicodemus over these past days, I can't help but think that what we have here is not an attempt to try to trap Jesus not even necessarily a, a, a fearful uh, kind of approaching to Jesus, but more of a quiet, uh, uh, more, more of, a, of, a, of a beginning to approach Jesus. Surely you know people like this. They may ask you questions about your faith. They're not there to debate. They're not there to argue. They just simply have a question. They're not there and ready to embrace everything that you might say, but, but their question shows that they have an interest. And here we see the same kind of beginnings, I believe, in Nicodemus. Now, I'm not alone in thinking this. J.C. Ryle, in his commentary, writes that the history of Nicodemus is meant to teach us that we should never despise the day of small things. We must not set down a man as having no grace because his first steps towards God are timid and wavering, and the first movements of his soul are uncertain, hesitating, and stamped with much imperfection. We must remember our Lord's reception of Nicodemus. He did not break the bruised reed, or quench the smoking flax when he saw before him, which he saw before him. Like him, let us take inquirers by the hand and then deal with them gently and lovingly. In everything, there must be a beginning. It is not those who make the most flaming profession of religion at first who endure the longest and prove the most steadfast. Judas Iscariot was an apostle when Nicodemus was just groping his way slowly into full light. Yet afterwards, when Nicodemus was boldly helping to bury his crucified Savior, Judas Iscariot had betrayed him and hanged himself. This is a fact which ought not to be forgotten. Ryle gets at, I think, a very good point there, a very important thing to remember as we think about this, this moment. And I know that our minds are immediately drawn to Jesus' words, and, and rightly so. We must be born again. What does that mean? But remember that it's in the context of this conversation with this particular person. It is not a doctrinal debate. It is not a moment in which we just sort of puff ourselves up in pride, whether we know or whether we think we know what it means, but rather... We remind ourselves that we live in a dark world and that there are those who are groping. There are those who are looking for answers. There are those who are seeking even though they don't understand what they are seeking. Well, Nicodemus gives his first testimony, if you will, in his opening words. He comes to Jesus and he says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I notice that Nicodemus says the we. It's most likely the case that, that while he's there on his own, he, 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 he's speaking because there's been talk about Jesus among the Pharisees. They were, after all, curious about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had said that he wasn't the one who was to come, who was rather making way for the one who was to come. And it seemed to the Pharisees that this Jesus might actually be him. He might be the one who was to come. We know that no one can do the things, that, the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now notice that Nicodemus is not confessing Christ as Lord at this point. He is not calling him the, uh, the, the Messiah. He refers to him as rabbi, which simply means teacher. But nevertheless, it is a term of endearment, a term of respect. And notice that he says, you are a teacher come from God. Jesus' signs had their effect on Nicodemus. While others might have looked at the signs and the signs alone, Nicodemus looked at the signs and recognized that they were to point to something else and that something else was that Jesus was sent by God. Undoubtedly, Nicodemus is thinking along the lines of everything that the Old Testament taught about the one who would come, about the prophet that God would raise up. The truth is, there were other wonder workers in Jesus' day, even as there have always been. The magicians of Pharaoh's court were able to imitate some of Moses' signs during the plagues. 
that there was something about Jesus, what he was doing, that had a more clear witness that he'd been sent from God. Nicodemus, we would say, isn't completely wrong. It's not as though we shoot him down immediately. He's asking the right kinds of questions, or at least he's beginning to see the right kinds of things. But as I said, Jesus wants to give him an answer. Look at verse 3 with me, and we're in our second point now. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we might be tempted to wonder if Jesus was paying full attention here. Nicodemus didn't ask a question. We've all probably been in that situation when somebody is speaking to us and we just mumble out an answer, although we don't really know that we heard what they said correctly. That wouldn't be our Savior, of course. He wouldn't have that kind of weakness in him, but rather he knows what is in man. Now, perhaps you have a different translation there and it simply says that Jesus said to him, but I want to just note that the word that, that John uses here uh, um, uh, in, in the Greek, it, it, it's in the passive tense. It, it, it specifically denotes that Jesus is responding to what Nicodemus has said. In other words, it's not that Jesus is throwing out a different statement. It's directly in relationship with what Nicodemus said. But as I've already noted, that Nicodemus hasn't asked Jesus a question. But Jesus knew all people. We see this over and over again in the Gospels. Jesus knows what's in their hearts. They might mutter in their hearts, but Jesus knows and he'll ask them a question on the basis of what he knows is in their hearts. He knows the questions that have nagged at Nicodemus. In a sense, Jesus maybe doesn't respond to what Nicodemus has said, but rather he responds to what Nicodemus truly wants to know. If Jesus has been sent by God, how can he see God? Nicodemus, after all, is a Pharisee steeped in the Old Testament uh, 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 stories. He knows, of course, that moment where Moses asked to see God's glory. If Jesus is sent from God, he wants to see all that Jesus can show him. And so Jesus gives him his answer. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And note first the necessity of being born again. Before you even think about what it means, Jesus says, truly, truly, Verily, verily, other translations give it. It's an absolute must. Jesus is affirming from the very outset the absolute necessity of this being born again. That's why we must understand it. We must seek to, to, to understand what Jesus is getting at here. His words, as you can imagine, have caused some confusion. And I think that's probably also good because they caused confusion for Nicodemus. The words that are used here, simply the Greek words that are used, uh, can have one of three different meanings. The first is just to be physically born a second time. And this is clearly how Nicodemus understands it. This is clearly how he sees it as he talks about going back into his mother's womb. Can a man who is fully grown go back into his mother's womb? He needs to be physically born a second time. It can also mean starting all over from the beginning. Sort of a hitting reset. It can mean that as well. But maybe a literal rendering of it, and you might even have a footnote that tells you this in your Bible. A literal rendering of it would be born from above. And the word that's used here, uh, uh, um, um, for again, it means from above. And it's used that way later in this chapter. And in fact, in every other instance that it's used in the Greek New Testament, it is translated in the English as from above. And so you might wonder, why is it not translated from above here? And I think that the translators rightly render it as born again because from above doesn't get at Nicodemus' own confusion. And so while it can be, and perhaps we can say uh, a, a good rendering of it is being born from above, the truth of the matter is we want to preserve what the moment is here in this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Now before we further consider the meaning of Jesus' words, we want to understand what is at stake. He says that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now some think that it simply means that he cannot understand or comprehend the kingdom of God. I think rather it means that he cannot enter, he cannot enjoy, partake of it, or possess it. This, I believe, is the true meaning of what Jesus says. This, I believe, is the true meaning of what Nicodemus' heart desired. 
For Nicodemus being steeped in the Old Testament and all the stories and all the promises and all the hope that is there was waiting eagerly for the Messiah to come. He would desire to be part of that that kingdom that the Messiah would bring. And that brings us then to Nicodemus' confusion there in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is thinking that Jesus is saying one must be physically born a second time. And in this way, he, he, he in a sense misunderstands what Jesus says. This is one of the reasons that some see Nicodemus as being far from the kingdom of God at this point. For the Apostle Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, we've all had this experience, I'm sure, as we talk with somebody about the things of God, about the spiritual truth, about the realities of sin and salvation. They might look at us and and, and just think that we're, we're strange. This is how Nicodemus looks at Jesus. We need to understand that Jesus is ushering in not something new so much as what was fulfilled, a fulfillment of what was promised. It's just that they didn't understand what was promised. For Nicodemus, a birth other than one that was like his natural birth seems to have been beyond his understanding. But for him, birth for him was limited to physical birth. And so Jesus answers his frustration with a more pointed explanation of his meaning there in verse 5. Jesus answered, truly, truly, there it is again, that truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Once more, Jesus shows the necessity, the importance of his words by prefacing them with truly, truly, In Jesus' mind, this is an irreversible matter. It is not something that is up for question. He says, though, that one must be born of the water and of the Spirit. And you might think to yourself, that doesn't seem to clear things up. That doesn't seem to clear things up for you because uh, um, um, being born of the water and of the Spirit may not have as much or or, or any more uh, uh, um, explanation than being born again. I hope by the time we're done, we'll see that it should have been enough for Nicodemus. Before we get to that, there have been four ways that this has been interpreted throughout church history. The first one is simply that baptism is in view, and particularly by water, it's John the Baptist's baptism. And some might think that that makes sense since we are nearest to John the Baptist's waters in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 showed us that John the Baptist had been baptizing in the River Jordan. He had also baptized Jesus as well. And so the idea then being that this is making reference to John the Baptist's baptism as well as the, 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 uh, uh, being uh, born of the Spirit. Others think that this has to do with Christian water baptism. Christian water baptism and then the work of the Spirit along with that. In support of this, support of this view, it can be said that the original readers of this gospel might have actually seen the reference of water in the reference of water, an allusion to Christian baptism. I think this is unlikely to be the meaning, especially since Nicodemus would have not understood such a connection to Christian baptism, which was only introduced in Christ's resurrection. But I also want to be careful not to separate this passage from baptism. For water baptism is a sign, and as a sign is meant to point to something. And I believe that water baptism points to the work of the Spirit to being born again. There are those who also think that this has reference to natural birth and spiritual birth. Being born of the water, uh, sort of a, a metaphor for natural human birth when the, when the mother's water breaks. And so Jesus is then saying, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, one must be born spiritually as well as physically by the Spirit as well as by water. Well, all of those views aside, I think the better one is this. It is spiritual regeneration, spiritual birth that is being shown here with a double metaphor, with a double metaphor. 
And sport of this view is the fact that elsewhere in this gospel, water functions as a metaphor for spiritual work, for the Spirit Himself, or for the supernatural work. In just another chapter, in John chapter 4, in verse 10, Jesus is going to be speaking to a Samaritan woman by a well. And He's going to say, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked Him, and He would have given you living water. John chapter 7, we're going to see Jesus in the last day of a great feast. He's going to stand up and he's going to say, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is affirmed, by the way, the work of water and spirit really uh, pointing to one another, really being connected in this way or being a double metaphor for the same thing is found elsewhere. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration. Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul is speaking about the relationship between husband and wife, he breaks in to speaking about the relationship between Christ and the church. In the work of Christ, he says that he might sanctify her, that is, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Now that's the New Testament, and Nicodemus doesn't have the New Testament. I don't think that we should expect Nicodemus to understand everything that I'm saying about the New Testament. In fact, later on, Jesus is going to say to him, are you a teacher of Israel and you don't understand this? That's the clue that Jesus is referencing something from the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you... Go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 27. You'll find this exact same language being used there of water and spirit. Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. Here, uh, this is what it says. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And it will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Here we see in Ezekiel that spirit and water really are again two metaphors for the same reality. And that reality is in fact the work of what we call regeneration, to be born again. Before we come to that as a topic more generally, let's finish our text. Look at verse 7 with me. Jesus responds, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Do not marvel, he says. Now, I think we ought not to marvel because this is the constant message of Scripture. Being born again means a complete change of heart and character which is produced in a man by the Holy Spirit when he repents, believes on Christ, and is, in fact, a true believer is a change which is often spoken of in the Bible under different titles, but it all amounts to the same thing. And this is why, again, he ought to have known as a teacher of Israel. In Deuteronomy, it is called being circumcised in the heart. In Ezekiel, as we've already read, it is talked about as taking that heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh, being given a new spirit. Turning to the New Testament in the book of Acts, we read his repentance and conversion In Romans, it is called being alive from the dead. In Corinthians, it is called being a new creature, a new creation. In Ephesians, it is called being made alive with Christ. In Colossians, it is called putting off the old man and putting on the new. In Titus, it is the washing of regeneration. In Peter, it is called being called out of darkness into light. In in John's first epistle, it is called passing from death. To life. One commentator puts it, I believe that all these expressions come to the same thing in the end. They're all the same truth, only viewed from different sides. They all mean that mighty inward change of heart, which our Lord here calls a new birth, and which John the Baptist foretold would characterize the Messiah's kingdom. But Jesus makes clear not only the necessity of being born again, he makes clear further the one who must, that, that, that being born again is a work done to us, not by us. For no one here can take credit for their own natural birth, nor can they take credit for their spiritual birth. 
And that, I believe, is the connection that Jesus draws out here. But he does say that you can see its effects. You can, in fact, see the results of being born again. Just as a child being born, you know the effect. You hear the sound. You hear the cries. So also, we see the effect of the work of God's Spirit. This is where Jesus closes our text out in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now you know that the word translated here for spirit and wind are, are both actually in the, are, are the same in both the Hebrew and the Greek. In the Hebrew, it's the word ruach. In the, in the Greek, it's the word pneuma. Both are used there for spirit and wind, and translators must decide which one is being used there. But Jesus' point is clear enough. The spirit works how and when he wishes. How and when he wishes. Indeed, it is the case that being born again is a work of God's Spirit. The Old Testament picture of this, of course, is the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. When God shows to, it shows to His prophet a valley full of dead bones, and He says, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's words are, you know, O Lord. And so God says to him, He says, prophesy over these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. There is that word again for spirit, for wind, breath. You shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Here we see Jesus drawing on that same idea of the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit in the life of God's people. The wind that blows where it wishes, where it comes from, we do not see. We do not see the wind itself, but only the effects of the wind. So also the Apostle Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Beloved, all of this that Jesus says here points to that glorious doctrine of regeneration. To be born again means to be made new in the Spirit. It means to be, to be set apart and to belong to God. It's that radical renewal of a person's inner being by the work of God's Spirit. So clear uh, and so important is this that Jesus says that without being born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And so Jesus lays this out for us so clearly here. And we could say, we could turn to other passages to fill out what it means to be born again or what it looks like to, be, to belong to Christ. We could sum it up very simply with the words of Jesus that we heard as we came into our worship this morning, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Indeed, we can say that that growth and desire for holiness in life is in fact a mark of being born again. For as John will say in his epistle in 1 John 3, 9, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Those words of John there in his epistle do not mean that believers do not sin, but rather that they do not give themselves over to sin. To be born again then means to be born from above. To have that spiritual rebirth such that you call out to Christ. You acknowledge Him not just as a great teacher or a rabbi, but as the Lord of heaven and earth, the one who redeems you from your sin. It is to call out in faith and repentance. This is what it means to be born again. To be born again means to have the marks of new birth. Faith. Repentance drawing near to God through prayer, trusting Him in all things. Indeed, this is what Jesus says is required. This is what Jesus calls us to each and every day, even as we know it is not something that we ourselves do. And here we find true, true encouragement to our hearts. For, beloved, if we are not the ones who save ourselves, then we are left uh, throwing ourselves upon God's mercy in Jesus Christ. If we are not the ones who save ourselves, then parents are left praying for their children and their salvation day after day. 
if we are not the ones who save ourselves, then we cannot be lost, but we belong to the one who saves us. All of this we'll see John will draw out in the rest of his gospel as he brings encouragement. But the question before us this morning, of course, is this. Are we born again? Do we trust in Jesus? This isn't meant to, uh, to, to strike a sense, of, a sense of, of anxiety in any heart, save in those who have not trusted in Christ. It reminds us that we cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again which means we cannot see the kingdom of God without the work of Christ in our hearts, without the Spirit who draws us. And so together, let us continually call out in faith to our God that we might be reminded that we are, in fact, those who have been born again, but also to pray for those who have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, those who sit outside of the kingdom. But also let us be reminded that even as this conversation and this gospel takes place in the context of Nicodemus, a man whose faith would slowly grow, that we ought to also, with the same tenderness of Jesus Christ, speak to those who are outside of the kingdom, to tell them, yes, what it is that must happen for them to be part of the kingdom. They must repent and believe, in, they must repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. But we will not force anybody to do that. They simply wait for the work of the Spirit within their hearts. And I understand that that waiting can be hard. But the good news is that salvation does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. And therefore, we will trust Him.